Hi, I'm Andrew. And I'm Alex. Be sure to stay tuned. We're about to embark on an amazing tour of some of the coolest car shows right here in South Florida. Okay, see that's good. Look, okay, that you got to a little Guy Fieri in there, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? You got, there's got to be a little yeah, excitement. Yeah. Hello, <laughs> I'm, it's, it's like a Bartles and James commercial for right now, you know? <laughs> Thank you for your support. Hi, this is Andrew McCleary with Car Show Television. We're here with Brian Stiles. He's been kind enough to invite us in and show us his collection. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the cars that he's got. My name's Brian Stiles. Welcome to the zoo. What is the zoo is what most people first ask. And it is our Autosports Club Museum and Car Collection here in Boynton Beach, Florida. The zoo is home to many fierce creatures, including cougars and fish and goats and a bunch of fowl cars I'm talking about, muscle cars from the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, here we're in the lounge area of the zoo and in the lounge you'll find a couple plasma screens, of course a full commercial bar, uh, reading material and a lot of memorabilia. Um, basically the idea is that this is a social place, it's a place to hang out with friends whether they are whether they're car people or not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we can watch the game, we can play some pinball, shoot some billiards, look at pictures, uh, and just have a good time. You know, play poker, whatever it might be, it's a place to gather and have fun. Yeah, I was gonna say, there's some great stuff on that bookshelf. <laughs> you know, everything from the original STP motor oil to, you know, uh, the stress booby to, you know, some stuff my dad sent me, like the, you know, the Esquire playing cards and nudie lighter there. <laughs> it's, it's just, uh, the, that's Samantha when we were at, uh, oh, what was it, the uh, Muscle Car and Corvette Nationals up in Chicago, yeah. which if you haven't been to, best muscle car show of, of the entire country, if not the world, once a year, the weekend before Thanksgiving. What I'd like to point out is this isn't my collection. I'm the caretaker. You know, I never use the term owner because it's, it's a very finite term. Owner means you get the bills. Caretaker means you get the fun, okay. right? And uh, the way I look at it, when properly preserved and the story's told, what we're really doing is we're, we're passing along the passion. We're promoting the hobby, right? And I think that's the real purpose of a caretaker is it's, it's my responsibility, it's our responsibility to make sure that these cars are appreciated by future generations while we're here and long after we're gone. The majority of the cars here actually belong to Samantha Stiles. She pays the bills, I get to enjoy them. I'm the curator, I'm the caretaker. It's my responsibility to make sure that these cars are cared for, that the stories are told, and that we get the chance to you know, talk about it, whether it's on TV or in person. Um, there are other cars here from other collectors as well. Again, the whole idea of the zoo is it's a social gathering place, it's a club, and it's a place for people to come and enjoy good conversation and great cars. Okay, let's see, What's, what started this? Uh, well, I guess I could take it back to the time that I was probably about this tall, and uh, my, first, my first car would be a Murray pedal car. Uh, and I think I also had a whole lot of Matchbox and Hot Wheels cars when I was a young child. My passion for the automobile has, has been prolific ever since, and it was probably in the last 10, 12 years that I began hunting for full-size cars that I could actually fit in and drive. I think that most people, including myself, collect for one of two reasons. Either you had it, lost it, and want it back, or it's something that you never had and always wanted. For me, I never had a cool car in school, uh, I always had what uh, you could say a hand-me-down from my parents, uh, but now, uh, you know, I'm in a place in life where I'm able to hunt these cars down and, uh, and, and help curate, you know, the collections of, of a couple friends. Uh, the first, or the oldest car in this collection, the oldest car in this collection, as I look around today, would probably be the 69 Camaro pace car over here. Uh, 396, 325 horsepower, big block, four speed power windows. It's a nicely optioned car. Original California car, you can still see the black plate on the front. Um, 
that car would have probably joined the collection right about 10 years ago. It's hard to say what drew me specifically to that car. I think that for me, you know, collecting these cars, the passion comes from the beauty, from the symmetry. Um, by no means am I a purist. Uh, you know, I'm not just a Pontiac person. I'm not just a Mopar person. I particularly like cars for the way that they're styled. Um, it's all about whether it does it for me or not. The 69 Camaro, I think, is the pinnacle of design of the Camaros. And I don't think I'm alone because with the new Camaro that was recently released, we see the mimicking of the 69 body style. Of course, it also has to be an RS because if the headlights don't hide away, I don't, I don't like the bug eyes. The passion has grown, but the 69 Camaro has always been and will always remain one of my favorites. But you know, it, it's tough when you ask for me to walk around and show you what my favorite is uh, because there's a special place in my heart for every one of these. But everyone's special for, for a different reason. You know, the, the Pontiac GTOs are special. These particular cars happen to have the biggest engine that you can get in a Pontiac production car, which was the 400 cubic inch round port Ram Air 4. Um, and, you know, the difference between the two, aside from color, uh, you know, black, of course, is a very rare color. Mating it with a red interior was a very, you know, unique combination. As a matter of fact, rarity-wise, once we get into it, a black car with a red interior, Ram Air 4, only two of them known to exist. Here we have a couple more Pontiacs. This in particular is a 69 Trans Am. It's a one-year only body style, the first year that the Trans Am was introduced to the public. About 697 total Trans Ams were built in 1969. You had two engine options. You had the Ram Air 3, which was the standard engine in a Trans Am, and of course the Ram Air 4. This is the Ram Air 3, blue standard interior, four speed. Nicely optioned car, still have the original window sticker for it. It's a very, very original sheet metal car. Everything's all there on it. Over here, we have a 1970 and a half. Of course, we lost a half a year due to the complete retooling of the car. This particular example has the big engine. It has the Ram Air 4, and it's mated to a four-speed. That makes it one of only 88 cars equipped that way. This one also happens to be a California car with the California mission system making it even more special. Here we have a 1969 Mercury Cougar. This one happens to be a pretty special car. Of course, when I say there's a new Cougar in South Florida, people don't necessarily think about a car, but this one is. Uh, of the Cougar convertibles that were built in 1969, only about 167 had the 428 Cobra Jet Ram Air engine option, also known as an R code. This is one of those cars. Also mated to a four speed transmission, makes this one of about 31 cars that received that engine transmission combination in 1969. Next up, we have a pair of 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner Superbirds. As you can see, both cars are pretty much identical. There's two, two main differences. The color, which is obvious, but the difference between why this one's worth one price and this one's worth twice the price happens to be what's under the hood. This is a 446 pack four-speed equipped car, and this happens to be the big dog, the four-speed Hemi equipped car. The Hemi is special because there were very few made. Only 58 left the factory with a Hemi made it to a four-speed manual transmission. In 1969, Dodge released the Daytona. Its purpose was to win NASCAR. But in order to enter your car into the races, you actually had to build 500 production cars. That was the rule in 1969. So Dodge built 500 Daytonas, or so the story goes. Insiders will tell you they kept pulling the cars out of one end of the factory and back around again to add up to the 500, and there's actually less than that. So the NASCAR officials didn't exactly like that. In 1970, they changed the rules and said you had to now build 2,000 production cars to be able to enter it into NASCAR. 
That was the Plymouth Superbird. Just over 2,000 of these were built. And once again, Mopar dominated NASCAR. By 1971, it was over with. They were banned forever. Here we have a 1969 and a half A12 Super B. This particular car was Dodge's answer to the street racer crowd. What they wanted to produce was a low cost, fast, straight line car. And the way that they achieved that is that they took these cars going down the assembly line that were originally slated with a 383 big block. They pulled the 383 out, dropped in a 440, put the six pack carburation on top, and then did further enhancements to lighten the weight of the car. A fiberglass hood, which takes two people to lift off and set on the roof, much lighter than the steel hood, no hood hinges. The small block, lighter weight, smaller battery, rather than the big block battery. No insulation underneath the carpet in the interior and stamped steel wheels without any hubcaps. They figured you were gonna put your own Craigers on as soon as you drove off the lot. This is a purpose-built car and kind of the precursor to the Daytonas and Superbirds. Here we have the sibling to the Dodge. This is the Plymouth Roadrunner. Of course, the top goes down on this one and it's equipped with the second biggest engine that you could order in this car. The first being the Hemi, the second being the 446 pack once again. This car is rare for a couple reasons. First off, the engine. They only built 34 US cars with a 446 pack in a 1970 Roadrunner convertible. And of course, it's a Mopar and it has lemon twist high impact paint, which just makes it you know, pop when it's on the street. Everyone kind of gets out of the way when they see this one coming. This is a fast car, and it's that oddity that we keep seeing over and over in the world of collecting. It's a convertible, but yet with the biggest engine that you can, or the second biggest engine in this case, that you can possibly order. Normally you'll find your convertibles with a smaller engine, an automatic transmission, because they were, for, they were purchased for a different reason. You put the top down, your arm around your girl, and you cruised versus buying a hard top with a big engine and a four speed to rack up a quarter mile at a time on the odometer, there are two different purposely bought cars. So when you find the big engine with the top goes down, you have rarity. And that's what collectors are going after these days. Mmm, I love the smell of carbon monoxide in the morning. So every zoo needs a bunch of different exhibits, and this one's no different. Here, we come across the fish exhibit. Specifically, I'm talking about barracudas, or in this case, a pair of hemicudas. They were rare cars. Not everyone checked off the biggest engine option that you could get. Of course, both of these are four speeds. This is a 1970, and this is a 1971. Both have the highly desirable shaker, which was pretty standard on the, on the Hemi Kuda, you know, cars. Um, both are four speeds and both are great colors. This is an early car, as a matter of fact, this is an early 1970, and you can tell at a quick glance because you've got the color match shaker. The later cars got the Argent color shakers. In 1971, they all had the black shakers. So if you're looking to put a Hemi Kuda in your stable, for most people, it's a decision of, do you like scales? Or do you like gills? Continuing in the fish exhibit, here we have a 1970 Cuda convertible. Once again, this is equipped with the second biggest engine that you could order, a 446 pack. This particular car happens to have a lot of cool options that make it one of one including the shaker hood, a white leather interior, of course a four speed. We also have turn signal indicators on the front fenders, driving lamps, hood pins, and even a luggage rack. Here we have two more cars, one built by Plymouth, a Cuda, 
one built by Dodge, a Challenger. What makes these more or less a pair is that both of them were purpose-built production cars to commemorate the Trans Am Racing Series. There's a number of options that these cars have that make them special. The high revving 340 small block, three two barrel carburetors, a six pack, a fiberglass hood for lighter weight, a factory rear ducktail spoiler, and a side exhaust. Hey, my name's Bill Gearhart. This is Cars and Coffee South Florida. This is our 13th event uh, since we started. We do monthly car uh, shows, I guess you could call it, our car collections where we get together uh, and um, just share our, our rides. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a show car. It's your everyday driver or it's, um, it is a show car in some cases. Uh, we rove every month, so we're a little unique for my Cars and Coffee event. Um, we're somewhere in the South Florida area from Fort Lauderdale to the Stewart area. And we generally hold one every month um, and we try to stay away from uh, car shows or car events so that we don't conflict with them. So we, we, it's a different weekend uh, when we do choose it. This weekend there happen to be no car shows. We're here at, uh, the, at the Brian Stiles Collection, the Stiles Collection and uh, having quite a good turnout even though it's a bit of a rainy day. We originally started this because uh, in the South Florida market the car shows run um, kind of dry up from April till October because of the rainy season and the heat. So we thought it would be a good idea just to do a couple hours on a Saturday morning where the guys could ride their cars, come talk to their car buddies, see some other cars and uh, enjoy their morning. And it's turned, about, turned out to be quite successful. Uh, we turned it into a not-for-profit. We really aren't about um, making a living out of this. This is much more of just sharing with our friends but doing something good for the community and getting able to see cars as, as we all love. So it's turned out to be really, really good. We have a following of about four or 500 people. Um, generally, different people, though, show up at the event depending on where it is. So it generally stays pretty local um, from a crowd standpoint. But as I said, we, we rotate from Dania up through the Stewart area. Um, and every month we do something a little bit different. It's either a private collection or it might be a car dealer or it might be a coffee shop. Um, no real theme to it, if you will. My name is Steve Sell. I live right here in West Palm Beach, actually out in Wellington. And uh, uh, I've had this car here for about uh, five and a half years. This one's a 1966. The car uh, was made in Germany, like I say, in 1966, in a little town called Karlsruhe. And the history of the car is uh, there's, a, there's a guy named Hans Trippel that that designed all the amphibious vehicles for Germany in World War II. He did such a good job that, that when, the, uh, when the war was over, the Allies didn't like him so much, they threw him in jail. This is a true story, by the way. And so he said while he was in jail, I'm going to get back at these guys, and I'm going to design a car and sell it back to them. And uh, designed this car and started mass producing them in 1961. And uh, they originally made about uh, 3,800 of them, uh, of which there's about uh, 350 left. Um, about 275 of them are in the United States, and the rest of them are in Germany and, and England. Uh, we have uh, a couple of car clubs here also, and we do uh, we don't do car uh, shows per se. We do what's called swim-ins. The car itself is 2,200 pound car. It's all steel. It has a steel bottom that's uh, twice as thick as the sides, and it's powered by a uh, Triumph uh, Spitfire engine, and it's about 43 horsepower. 
The unique part of this car is it has two transmissions in it. it they're both made by Porsche. Shift the car into uh, water drive, and then when you get out into the lake, you shift the land transmission in neutral. I fish off of this thing, uh, any of the freshwater lakes here, uh, catching bass and that sort of thing. I give a lot of rides to kids for birthday parties. And my favorite thing is that I like to watch the kids' faces when I go in the water because uh, a normal human reaction to a boat or a car going in the water is like it's going to sink and we're going to die. And I go pretty fast. I go about 20 to 20 to 30 miles an hour. And I put, a, I put a spray up that goes up and over the car. What started me on it is I'd never had even heard of them before. And uh, I own a couple of Nash Metropolitans besides this here that I've owned for many, many years. And every time I would go to a car show with one of those, some, uh, somebody would come up to me and say, does that car go in the water? And I'd say, no, what car goes in the water? And someone would tell me, oh, it's an Amphicar. car. <coughs> so I started researching it, and I ended up finding this one on eBay, believe it or not, up in New Jersey, and it was a basket case. So I rebuilt the whole car from scratch. Uh, I put all the metal in, welded it all in. The only thing I didn't do on the car was the paint job. The other interesting fact, too, is that Barrett Jackson has been selling these things for the last few years. Um, their average price for a Concours quality, which this one is not, is about $125,000. So they go for pretty good money just because they're, uh, they're a pretty unique car.